I'm Andy Signor, and welcome to the first episode of a new series of long-form, deep conversations from people who've been wronged, canceled, or ignored altogether. In each episode, one guest will share their personal process of embracing pain and confronting their own faults to learn from and start over. This is Hugging the Cactus. To ensure you never miss a story, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that notification bell to all alerts. It's the only way to ensure that YouTube will keep us in your feed. I'm here with Kaylin Ford. Kaylin, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I want to give a little bit of background before we start talking. Uh, we, you actually reached out to me when you saw my story. And as I heard your story, so different than mine, uh, but yet we found so many common things. And as we were speaking on the phone for that half hour or so, I realized, stop, we got to stop doing this dialogue. I want to do this as part of this thing I'd been building. And I know you were building your own as well. And I thought we got to tell this story so people can hear uh, us do this. Uh, do you remember that exchange as well? Did you feel that same way? Yeah, well, and, and I think, you know, there's there's a, a risk that in doing this, people are going to are gonna think like, oh, there's just two sort of wretched people commiserating about our, our shared wretchedness. But I, I mean, I sort of like that because, you know, we have like we have nothing in common, right? Um, you know, you were in L.A. making wildly successful sort of pop culture products. And I am like a sort of foreign policy, international human rights uh, background and a, you know, a disgraced former political candidate. Um, but I think that, yeah, the thing that we have in common is that we were both canceled. And um, that is an experience that transcends political tribes. So, This is Kaylin Ford, a mother of two and a major advocate for international human rights. She was recruited to run as a conservative party candidate for the provincial register in Alberta, Canada. Her political career was beginning to soar. And then one month before the election, short excerpts of private academic conversations that she had years earlier were posted anonymously and out of context by her opposing party, wrongfully painting her as an anti-immigrant white supremacist. Without any chance to respond, her reputation was destroyed overnight. I, my background is mostly in international policy and international human rights law. And then a couple years ago, I decided that, uh, that I would try to run for office. Politics doesn't really suit me temperamentally, um, but I thought there was an opportunity to get involved um, you know, in the province where I was born and raised. And I was running for a seat in the provincial legislature. So. Uh, we don't have a bicameral system at the provincial level, so basically this is the equivalent of a seat in the state house and senate. We were extremely successful fundraising, had a really very a very strong volunteer team. Um, I was a, quite a popular candidate, but I was running in a real battleground against the leader of one opposing party and the sitting justice minister for the other party, and it was a must win for them. And one month before the election, um, this article came out uh, in Press Progress. And Press Progress, for background, sort of quasi-media organization that is tied to the opposing political party. And three days after the massacre in Christchurch, where 50 Muslim worshippers were killed at prayer, they published an article claiming that I, basically, that I was sympathetic to white supremacist terrorists. And as happens with cancel culture, um, there's a rush to judgment, um, you know, there's no presumption of innocence, nothing resembling like due process or even a search for truth necessarily. So within four hours, um, my campaign that I had dedicated my life to for eight months that my volunteers had dedicated their lives to uh, was over. And I spent the next several weeks being a regular topic of media discussion as like disgraced white supremacist Kaylin Ford. <laughs> Look, like I'm, a, I'm the kind of person where if I, if I hold an opinion that is untenable or that's not true or well supported, like I want to know, right? And so, sometimes even now, when I see like my detractors on social media calling me a white supremacist or something, sometimes I still reach out to them and say like, I really want to understand what, where you think I'm wrong. Like, let me explain the context and what my meaning was, and like I'd like to have a dialogue. And then I find with very few exceptions, um, that they're not interested in dialogue. They're not interested in persuading you, right? Like they just, they wanna call you a racist to signal something to their peers about their own virtue. 
and like I think some of them probably like seem to genuinely revel in just the destruction of another human being. Um, so yeah, like there, there's still that every once in a while, I, I, you you kind of gaslight yourself because you start thinking like I must really be a terrible person. Um, I, I saw someone the other day who went through something similar like a year and a half ago, describe being being like a ghost. And I, I don't know if you feel that way, but I, uh, I thought that's like actually an incredibly apt description because you, you like inhabit this weird kind of spectral plane between living and not living where as a public person, you have been vaporized. You might as well not exist. You will wish that you didn't exist. And yet you're still here. <laughs> you still, you're conscious. You feel everything acutely. You see everything but then you're not seen and you basically you watch what would have been your life play out without you in it. And there's a lot of the people that you care about and the connections that you crave are somehow just beyond your reach as though there's some invisible barrier that sort of separates you from the world. So I'm like, I'm very much still in that, in that place. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm like, to, yeah, the short answer to, go, to your question is, yeah, I'm absolutely still in it. Well, and that makes me sad because, you know, in your situation, you didn't deserve that. And and I, everything you're saying rings so true to me uh, and obviously different stories, but obviously connections here. But yeah, I mean, your, your connection to a ghost, of course, I felt that way. And luckily enough, I had a following and luckily I was able to show my evidence. And that has allowed me to finally stand forward and have some people that aren't just there to knock me down. Because I remember those two years before I shared any evidence of exactly what you're saying of this frustration from people I thought were colleagues or friends, not even reaching out privately to help. And instead, all you're getting pounded on are those people who just want to watch you burn um, and judge you and quickly jump and assume, oh, well, he he hasn't learned. He needs to be told again, as if they, they you know, no concept of what it, it actually feels to be canceled. And I'm glad you're here to, to share this because anybody who's canceled, it is a toll emotionally, physically, everything that I just don't think people are understanding. Uh, and the fact that I think we're able to finally have these conversations, and I'm grateful we can have it, to really push people's minds to realize you got to just not jump to those conclusions. And if you see people doing it, even if you don't agree with the person, help them, reach out to them and make sure they are okay. Send them a, a message of support because my God, the, the, you know, the, the, the few lone people who did strangers who reached out, even on Twitter privately, even privately who would just say, man, I, I just, I'm here for you. I hope your family is okay. It really does give you the sort yeah. of the strength to move forward in a way that, you know, I don't think people understand like how knocked down people get. Um, and I don't want to, you know, go down there and, and, and get you emotional in those periods, but I imagine you relate. You had that similar, very low period where it's, it's hard to, as I said, it's like, it's just darkness. It's just like, you call it a ghost. I call it, I called it a, a sort of a darkness of, you know, there's just no light anywhere where you feel like you can turn it on uh, and you just don't want to get out and you don't want to be seen. And someone, I had a little bit more, uh, you know, people noticed me sometimes and I could tell when I was in Los Angeles, I didn't want to leave my house because I knew I people I were looking, know. you know, and, and with you, did you have that same problem? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like I, like I was, um, you know, this is, this is a local thing, but I was like, I was, you know, a front page above the fold, like many days after this first happened, it was, it, it's the story had surprising longevity. Um, and, uh, yeah, like, yeah, you, you, I, you develop a weird kind of agoraphobia. I was afraid to go out of, outside my house because I didn't want to be recognized. I didn't want to um, deal with questions from people who knew that I was running for office. And um, you, you're afraid every time someone looks at you, you're like, oh, my God, do they know? And if they know, what do they think? Um, you know, I was like I was disinvited from a couple um, social events. And when I, I had a friend who was getting married and I, I went to her like kind of rehearsal dinner. And I just remember sitting there thinking like, am I only here because she was too classy to uninvite me? <laughs> like, does anyone actually want me here? Um, and this is like, this is one of the mistakes that people make, I think, and when they, when they think about how this kind of outrage machine operates is that they assume that the target moves on with their life as quickly as everyone else does, yes. right? Like, the mob goes after you, you get your, you know, your week of, of being at the center of the sort of the, the outrage storm. And then the mob moves on to their next target. And I think that they assume that you do too, like that you just, that you go on with your life, uh, having been humiliated. And that is not at all the case. Like I'm unemployable. I'm 32 and I am like, I'm, 
you know, I don't, I don't see an end. Um, yeah, so the, the disproportionality of the effects of these kinds of things, um, whether it's for some, you know, whether it's kind of earned or not, um, it's still wildly disproportional. Uh, I, we, you, you and I had chatted a little bit about John Ronson's book last time, so you've been yeah. publicly shamed. And he uses the example of how, um, I think it was in, in sort of the 1800s in England, public shaming was a form of punishment after someone has been convicted of a crime that they would be subject to, to, to a public shaming process. And this was phased out because it was found to be too inhumane. Like after someone has actually been convicted, public shaming was seen as too inhumane. Um, and now we do it without conviction, without evidence. So yeah, that's, that's one thing I, I would wish that people understood about this is it's all very fun, I guess, to pile on in the moment. Um, but yeah, the, the effects, certainly they, they last indefinitely for, for the people on the receiving end. All right. Well, I want to get into the statements themselves because I think it's important we just hit that part and get it, get it through it because I know there are some critics still of you who think, well, no, wait, you said this and that. Let's go through it and give you the opportunity yeah. to say it. And, I, and I'm grateful that you're willing to do it. Um, the article published excerpts from conversations you had, and they said it was supplied by a longtime Muslim conservative with deep ties to the party who requested anonymity, uh, citing threat of retribution. Right there, I just have to offer my own critique because I just find that frustrating because the context of that, your relationship with this person, who they are, what their background is, are they a competitor of yours? All of those things play a huge part in figuring out, is this a reliable person who's accusing you of these yeah. things? And so right out the gate, my red flags went out. There are some people who say the identity of my anonymous accuser, the person who supplied excerpts of private conversations, some people will say that that's immaterial, um, that they can you know, still form judgments about what I was quoted as saying. Um, but here's why it is important. So already they're setting up a narrative where this guy is presented as a credible person who's trustworthy, who's sort of well-established and has standing within the political community um, and who's a whistleblower acting in the public interest. And they're implying that I've threatened him. Um, and so they're, they're setting up uh, a kind of a framework where he has moral authority, where he's a victim of mine. Um, and he's sort of boldly and courageously stepping out to call out um, sort of, I guess, hidden latent racism or something. Right. And, and um, also that he's Muslim, making it a big point to say, like, well, he must know then that you're anti-Muslim, which isn't, I don't think, a fair uh, knock either. No. again, And if you knew anything about this guy and his politics, you would find that characterization um, ironic. Yeah, well, it's all just in the yeah. marketing of the words they choose to describe him and then yeah. him not wanting and to come forward is very telling to me of why. where is he in the news trying to defend this? Because if he believes yeah. in this issue so wholeheartedly as a Muslim, you would be out there condemning you and not being afraid to be out there to condemn you because you would believe in your heart of hearts. Caitlin Ford cannot serve office because she's a white supremacist. That's right. what you would do if you were taking, I mean, that's just my opinion. Yeah, and the, the other reason why the identity and the motives of an accuser are relevant is, is because these are private conversations, and so no one is able to view the full context. Um, now, if this was you know, an essay that I had published, then, yeah, it doesn't really matter what the source is that brings it into, the, into public attention. But, look, if, if indeed this person were a kind of disinterested, responsible, fair-minded individual... Uh, with whom I'd had these conversations, and he's coming forward saying these excerpts are representative and represent uh, something to be concerned with, you'd have no reason to doubt the credibility of those accusations. When it's a person who has spent a full year trying various means to destroy you, then you have reason to doubt his motives. And that's what happened here. This guy, and we'll, we can get into this later, but um, the lengths that he had gone to to try to intimidate, defame, um, try to get me disqualified on completely unrelated grounds for reasons that had absolutely nothing to do with my purported views on immigration or terrorism or anything like that. Um, and that's the source. You, have, you should have every reason to doubt his motives. You should doubt the representativeness of what he's putting forward. Um, you should, yeah, he's just, he's not a credible source. And so um, yeah, right away, the fact that they concealed his identity um, and allowed him to have impunity uh, and then misrepresented who he was and what his motives were. Um, I think all of that alone, it's, it's evidence of the fact that they're 
either through gross negligence or willful deception, they are trying to mislead readers. They're, they're totally trying to mislead we- readers. And, and the next paragraph goes on to explain how verified you know, messages reviewed in person, and he signed an affidavit attesting that they sent these messages, da, da, da. They have not been altered or edited in any way is kind of a lie because they have been edited. They've been they taken out of been. context. That's they're <laughs> taking pieces. I can even tell. Like, I need to see your the response before and after you for me to take that seriously. Uh, yeah. And they don't offer any of those. I, I imagine that was frustrating. So, so that- so that's one, like, so one, they did actually, I know, I don't have, I should say, I don't have records of the conversations that this is based on. Um, I deleted them probably a year and a half ago when I sort of first severed my friendship with this person. So I couldn't go back and show people, here's the context, here's the prompts I'm responding to, here are the kind of the exculpating thing I say in the next paragraph, here's how I, you know, like, here are the priors that we had established over many months of discussion. You couldn't, I couldn't show people any of that. But I think what people do need to understand is it is incredibly easy to take something out of context, um, like a small snippet of a conversation, to then put it into a new context and read nefarious motives into it. Um, if you don't think this can happen to you, you are absolutely deluding yourself. Amen. And I, think it's been- <laughs> it's, it's, and, and I just want to echo it because people's narratives and people's own you know, uh, take on a thing will, will bleed into it in a way that creates malicious and scary yeah. and awful intense. That is never what the person may be meaning. Only the person really knows what they're meaning, but the media yeah. and, and the public and the mob like to just sort of make their own, you know, take on it. And that's now the way it is. Yeah. And, and you, you see, an, you saw an example with that, like the Covington Catholic thing was, I think, a prime example, how even though you have have video footage, right, and when the first one of those clips came out, um, it perfectly fit this narrative of, like, young, kind of preppy, white, MAGA hat-wearing Catholic boy looking smugly at a Native American elder, and it fit this narrative, and this guy's life was, like, he was was just pilloried, right? Um, And then when the full context came out, it you realize when the longer video came out, you realize that that's actually not that that image that was presented is not at all what happened. I got him, man. I got him, man. Another example, one of my favorites, and uh, uh, there's the this very distinguished British philosopher named Roger Scruton. He'd given an interview to the New Statesman, which is a kind of left leaning publication in England, and the reporter basically spent the whole interview prodding him and trying to provoke him to say controversial things. And he didn't really take the bait. But then the reporter came out with an article that made it look like he had. And one of the quotes in there was something to the effect of, all Chinese people are identical and it's terrifying. And this sounds like obviously or like a racist thing to say. And Roger Scruton was, he was tossed, like he was fired from his role advising the British government on, on architecture, on housing and was denounced. And then the full transcripts came out and he'd actually said something like, the Communist Party of China is so constraining the range of acceptable thought and opinion. They're trying to make it so that every Chinese person is identical and that is terrifying. And so what was actually a critique of a totalitarian regime was made to sound like a racist statement about Chinese people. And like, so you should, you should be extremely skeptical anytime that you're seeing a kind of a, a quotation without surrounding context and someone is trying to tell you what meanings to read into it. It's an extremely manipulative tactic. They also use the timing of now Charlottesville to sort of join this in, which is really unfortunate and I think unfair. And, and then tying back to Christchurch, there's clear manipulation there as well. They then hit talk about um, Jason Kenney and how dare he choose you. And that also is just an unfair sort of puts him in the spotlight to condemn you because now he has to. And it just yeah. it, it's hitting you, hitting, hit, 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 hit. Uh, and then finally gets to the quotes in question and then does a headline even before it. UCP candidate complained about public reaction to white supremacist terrorism following the Charlottesville neo-Nazi car attack, which is not what you did. Um, and then they go and actually put the quote in here and let's talk about this and I want you to respond. But the quote being, when the perpetrator is an Islamist, the denunciations are mingled with breathless assurances that do not represent Islam, that Islam is a religion of peace, etc. And there's a great deal of soul searching. We ask ourselves in earnest what radicalized these people. How can they be directed towards more productive and healthy paths within their faith, etc. And when it comes to neo-Nazi terrorism, 
When the terrorists are white supremacists, that kind of soul searching or attempts to understand the source of their radicalization or their perverse moral reasoning is beyond the pale. And anyone who shares even some of their views, i.g. wanting strong borders or immigration control, while rejecting the more odious aspects, is painted with the same brush. All are white supremacists. All should be extricated and denounced and marginalized. You just don't have the same attempts to separate the violent terrorists from the wider community of belief. I saw this as you really challenging the idea of not condoning it at all, but challenging yeah. the idea of how do we find out how to stop this kind of hatred. But I want to hear yeah. your words. Well, that, that's exactly it. So yeah, their, their interpretation of this, the headline that they had was that I complained white supremacist terrorists are treated unfairly. That was the way that they framed this. And I think that you need to be, you need to ha be very strongly motivated by bad faith to read the meaning into this that they did. Um, because yeah, there's nothing here complaining about how terrorists are treated. Um, but there's a couple, I think there's a couple meetings that I'm trying to convey on the one hand, um, you, you'll recall after nine 11 in particular, um, Muslim communities in America, as well as, um, Arab communities, Sikhs, South Asians faced a lot of undeserved and unfair stigma because of nine 11. And I think that that was wrong and profoundly unfair. And I think, I hope that we've learned our lesson from that, that that's not the way that it's, it's neither fair nor helpful to respond to terrorist attacks by blaming people who don't share any kind of culpability. Um, you know, this kind of associative reasoning where you say, well, this the terrorists have these traits and this other group of people shares some of those traits or like one of those beliefs and then to conflate them together as though they're exactly the same. Um, it's not helpful. And it's not helpful from the perspective of de-radicalization either. Like if you actually care about de-radicalization in the context of white supremacy and white nationalism and racism, the way to address it is not just by calling everyone racists and white nationalists. Um, that's not actually helpful. It doesn't change people's beliefs. It doesn't persuade them um, it, it tends to just create more enmity and mutual suspicion and mistrust. So, look, I'm, and I don't claim to have any special expertise in counterterrorism, but I know something about it. And um, you, you do actually need to try to understand what the grievances are that, that is driving this and what are the kind of social conditions that are leading people down these kinds of paths. So, yeah, I, I just don't, I don't think there's, anything here that a serious person looking at this with any level of good faith or charity could could um, interpret the way that they did. And one of the quotes in this article that I found particularly rich was they quoted my accuser. Do they really want a candidate who says that white supremacist terrorists are misunderstood? She needs to be immediately dropped from the ballot um, in this election it's very emotionally manipulative and it's designed to ev evoke a very visceral negative response in the person reading it. Cause it's made to make you think that I, um, you know, sympathize with the actions of terrorists or with their beliefs. But the irony is, um, it's probably true that public perceptions of what radicalizes terrorists are usually, if not wrong, then grossly oversimplified. And if you are serious about combating terrorism, you actually do need to make a more serious attempt to understand the sources of that radicalization. So the way, the fact that something like that could be twisted in this way speaks to the, the general sort of dumbing down of our political discourse, where any amount, like, you know, the ability to look at any issue in a nuanced way is just, has just been completely jettisoned in favor of kind of hollow sound bites and images and accusations. All right, I want to get to the next statement that got you a lot of heat. And this is, was headlined on Press Progress as saying, UCP candidate said she is saddened by the replacement of white people in their homelands. And the quote that they published says, I am somewhat saddened by the demographic replacement of white people in their homelands, more in Europe than America, partly because it's clear that it will not be a peaceful transition, and partly because the loss of demographic diversity in the human race is sad. But even before you sort of defend that, I think it's important for me to also point out that a reporter actually sent you a script screenshot of this uh, specific quote in question. And while they said it wasn't edited, 
it really was edited because they took out a very important piece at the beginning to offer actual context where you said, I would reject that appellation, FYI, but yeah, I am somewhat saddened to send context of that you were clearly disagreeing, but begrudgingly sort of going down this path, uh, this intellectual path that your accuser is <laughs> clearly putting you on. You can see it at the top of where you know, we can see a hint of something about intellectual path. You guys were clearly doing an intellectual conversation and challenging each other into this conversation, um, which then prompted this idea that to me, you know, I can see out of context with that beginning of you saying I'm somewhat, yeah. the key word oh, yeah. of somehow can, is important yeah. too, but this, I can, this, I can absolutely understand. I absolutely understand how even reasonable, fair-minded people would look at this and cringe because I did like when this article was published and I read that, I didn't think that these were my words. Um, I found it extremely perplexing. So I understand like these are these are words that are kind of ambiguous, but potentially very loaded, I think have become more loaded since the time that we had this conversation. Um, and so, you know, in that sense, like, yeah, I, I totally get that. And like, yeah, mea culpa, I, I probably should have been a lot more, um, even though I think that the nefarious intentions that were read into this were not present. Um, I understand why, why it, it looks like that. Yeah. And I, at the same time, I, I want to have you defend the words even because it, it then goes on to say the UCP candidate suggested Western culture will collapse if another race takes over. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, which is not what you're implying. I think it is <laughs> unlike they, these headlines above your quotes are always very, again, red flags when you see an article do that because yeah. they're setting up their own narrative of how they want you to read the next quote you're about to read. Uh, and yeah. so they set the tone. I think it's unlikely that Western culture will survive without Western people. Why would another race want to cast away their own culture to adopt someone else's on such a massive scale? I suspect that that one might have also been slightly edited. There's a couple word choices there where I'd be like, oh, no, I, I don't think that I said it like that. But yeah, either way, I think that the we can talk about what the, the actual meaning is. So, yeah. So what, what, what go ahead. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that. What, what you know, what are you trying? What were you trying to say there? How do you think that conversation started? So I, I think that it probably if if indeed it followed from that initial that first conversation, I think that it was you're engaging in an exercise of trying to understand what are the grievances of people who are worried about mass immigration. Cause this is a, a an anxiety that's shared very broadly in the United States uh, and in Europe. Um, it's driving the rise of a lot of right-wing populist parties. So this is a really important social and political issue. And a lot of the right-wing populist parties that are coming to power um, you know, including support for Trump is closely tied to concerns about mass migration. Brexit is largely a response to concerns about mass migration. This is a really big issue. And I think it's, um, I think it's worth trying to, rather than just saying that all of these people who have anxieties are just racists and white supremacists, I think it's valuable to try to inhabit their perspective and their frame of mind and understand what are they concerned about. Um, and I think that's kind of where this came from. Um, and then I was probably asked something like, well, do you share their concerns about large scale demographic change? What here we, we term to demographic replacement? Do you share that concern? And my answer was, well, I reject the term. It's not sure. It's not clear what term I'm rejecting, but I'm rejecting some, something about the way that this conversation is being set up. I reject the term, but I am somewhat saddened by it. And the reasons I gave, this is what most people skipped over. They didn't, they like couldn't read a compound sentence. So they just paid attention to the first part and not the second. The reasons I gave is that I think that any kind of large scale societal change of this nature is liable to be destabilizing. Um, and it will, it will produce political and social instability. I think you'll have more kind of internecine interethnic violence, more instances of terrorism, anti-immigrant backlash, and all of these things, I think, are sad and lamentable. Um, and, I, and you're already seeing evidence of these trends unfolding in Europe. Um, and then the other reason I said I was saddened by it is because um, I generally assume, maybe wrongly, and I'm open to having this conversation with anyone who would want to, um, that large-scale migration coupled with low birth rates in the receiving countries, coupled with all sorts of other like urbanization and um, kind of just global consumer culture generally, that all of these things seem to represent a threat to the, the, to the diversity of local cultures. 
um, because generally kind of globalization has a sort of flattening and homogenizing effect on culture. So, so that was what I was said I was saddened by is, you know, if you like the unique character of some little area in Ireland or in Italy or something where birth rates are like 1.3 children per women, um, and you have urbanization that's hollowing out those areas on top of that, that, yeah, that's kind of, that seems like something that's, that I find vaguely lamentable. Well, and let's call a spade a spade. The, the article itself goes on the completely biased and terrible article. It, it's just, they, they created this intent in there. That's just, it just makes me make a skin crawl. That's not the only thing Ford said makes her sad. Later in the conversation, Ford, <laughs> Ford declared, I think it's unlikely that Western culture will survive without Western people. And then yeah. in their own and, words, and that, if another race yeah. becomes dominant, which is not at all the words you it's used and completely said. sets and, and, a... And what I'm responding to there is partly like, so the person I'm talking with, we talked to like his favorite topic of discussion is immigration, like civic nationalism, issues of identity. Um, and basically he's someone who believed that Western countries should adopt a policy where they, um, they encourage immigration, but where immigrants are expected to completely assimilate to the host culture. Like leave, he said once wrote, leave all their cultural baggage at the airport, that they should do away with their, um, any ties to their ancestral homelands, um, their language, their cuisine, their dress, they should abandon it all and they need to completely assimilate. And there certainly are a lot of people who choose to do that, but I question whether it's possible to do that at the scale um, that that is now kind of in play. So that's what I'm responding to there is basically a proposal that um, that immigrants will just completely adopt not only the sort of the like a veneration for certain institu sort of institutions and civic values, but they're they're going to completely adopt even the local customs of the host culture in a way that just seems in many cases not really practical or a reasonable expectation to me. And again, this is a, this is a, a, a discussion that we had over many months where um, like I'm open to being persuaded on these issues. Um, I don't have a lot of really rigid fixed opinions. It's just, it's an academic discussion where you're kind of weighing different sources of evidence and different perspectives. Um, so, and that's yeah. what's frustrating about this conversation and him calling you out out of context because we can't read the context. And it's unfair for someone to anonymously create a narrative themselves about a conversation without then revealing what their words were too. Um, yeah. And this, this site is filled with atrocious bias, uh, you know, narrative pushing to sort of make sure anybody who reads it will be offended uh, and yeah. take your words in an even harsher way. Um, yeah. so, I mean, the, I, you, you've covered, and thank you for getting in there and, and walking through these with me. I know that's tough and it must be frustrating to relive these moments. Um, there was something yeah. else I wanted to call out because you did do, uh, an apology, apologia, uh, but you never apologized. And I know a lot of your critics were very upset with you for just like, what? well, she never did. And that was used against you in a way to sort of make it seem like, well, she's not sorry. And I, and I, it was something I wanted to talk with you about. And, and I don't, not to, to say you did anything wrong, but I think it's a fascinating sort of debate to talk about because even in my own situation, you know, there were moments where I was like, well, I didn't do a lot of these things people think I did, but I clearly made some women feel uncomfortable in my situation. And I do want to apologize for that. Do you feel like your words, you know, even out of context or seeing the way they were, made people feel uncomfortable or is there any sort of thing wrong that you feel like deserves an apology or are you just afraid to give an apology for the sake of then admitting to things that you didn't do? So that, yeah, the question when you find yourself at the, at the heart, like at the center of a kind of outrage mob, the question of whether to apologize is one that people, people grapple with. And there's two dimensions of it. On the one hand, some people apologize because they assume that if they apologize, then the mob will just move on and forgive them. And that's a mistaken view in most cases. Um, usually apologizing uh, makes, it confirms people's suspicion that you did something wrong and it actually, like they smell blood and they actually will, will go after you harder. So as a pragmatic strategy, unfortunately, contrition is actually not very helpful. But the, the, uh, the dimension that's more important to me is just like the sort of the personal moral question. Do you have something to apologize for? Um, I think I like apologizing. Um, I think we should apologize for our true faults. I don't think we should apologize for invented crimes. And 
um, because that's it's it's a form of lying. Um, there's something very strange to me about the people who demand public apologies, for especially for non-public things. Because um, on the one hand, they're demanding, like if they're demanding that you apologize for beliefs that you don't have, they're asking you to lie. If they're demanding that you apologize for beliefs that you do have, they're also asking you to lie. And so what they're, what they're actually engaged in is a kind of act of, of very, I think, cruel dominance. Um, to try to force you to say something you don't believe in. And I'm not going to do that just for the satisfaction of a baying mob. Um, but uh, I did, you know, I, I did really try to think very hard about, did I do something wrong? And um, I understand that the things I was quoted as saying, and the way that this article was framed, that this caused real anguish and pain to a lot of people, including people I care about. And um, that that's devastating to me. Um, and I'm, I'm very sorry that people felt that way, especially because they timed this. They were sitting on this material for months, by the way, and then they put it out right when they did because that was when it was most politically expedient for them to do it. Um, but I think that they misappropriated a tragedy in Christchurch to write an article that would cause really maximum anguish to a, a faith community that was already feeling under siege. Um, so that that makes me like I, I I I'm very upset about that. I think it's an incredibly callous thing to do. I'm very sorry that people felt that that pain. On the other hand, I don't think I caused it. I don't think I caused that pain. I certainly never meant to cause that pain when I had a private conversation <laughs> years before um, where the kind of meanings that were imputed to me were sim and, the, and the motives were simply not present. So um, on the one hand, like I can, I can cop to being maybe careless with the words that I use in private conversations and I'm very sorry that this caused real people real pain. I don't think, I haven't been persuaded yet that I am culpable for that. And so I can't apologize for it. Well, and I think that's a good enough answer for me. And I think you put that out beautifully. And, and, and it's a tough thing that I think people don't understand when you're, when you're accused of things that you really do push. And I imagine you did, similar to me, of push yourself uh, hit yourself hard in the mirror. Of, well, did I, I must have done something wrong to deserve this. Yeah. I imagine you had those moments, and, and those moments really can break someone and make yeah. you think you did do something wrong. Um, and I, and I, like, I, I tried, and I still, I still do this. Um, like, I've tried reaching out to people who, um, who, who did find what, the, you know, the, the statements that were quoted in this article, who found them offensive. Um, and I've really tried having these conversations saying like, you know, if you're willing to have this conversation with me, I would really like to understand. Let me explain to you where I'm coming from, what the priors were, what I'm responding, what I think I was responding to. Um, and, you know, if I've, if I'm missing something here, if I have some blind spot that I'm overlooking where I've been insensitive, I want to know because I want to correct it. Um, and there, there were a couple people who were, I think, yeah, like who kind of humored me and were patient with me and tried to explain. And, um, and those conversations are valuable and, and in their own way edifying. I'm not sure that I'm fully satisfied still, but like at least I can kind of get some, some more understanding and insight. Um, and at the end of the day, I think most of those people come to say, well, okay, now that I understand where you're coming from, I realize that you never intended to cause any pain. So... Um, those are the valuable conversations, but the people who are just hurling epithets at you on social media are not interested in having those conversations. No. And you said something really interesting. I want to, I want to bring up because in your, in your statement that you released, uh, you poised an interesting question and I think it's very relevant to what we're talking about. And you said, here's a thought experiment. If evidence emerged that I am not a racist or a bigot in any other, or any other terrible thing, if I was actually a kind and decent person, would you feel relieved or would you cling to your original assessment? and try to discredit the new evidence. And that really stuck with me because I think it's so true and it's so true to what 
what I'm trying to do with the show and cancel culture in general, we are pushed to extremes now in our, you know, tribalism of what side we have to stand by and that we refuse to see another side because we don't want to disrupt our own stories, right? Our own belief systems. And so we will then look for and pick apart, you know, the, straight answer in front of us you are a, i mean i i trying to get some of your credits in there and you can you can attest to it but i mean you were advocating for refugees uh human rights of persecuted cultures i mean you you did a whole documentary uh that's a fantastic like your background if anybody had done research on you just really does not make sense for someone would that would be a white supremacist and so this idea that you know none of that matters well all of it was for in with is wrong or or evil it's just really scary that the group a group can't say oh great look she's not look she's not a racist she's not a white supremacist woo yeah. that was close instead it's well no that must be because of this or that because of that and that's just terrifying as a society yeah and and i think it's it's partly because like like i was a political candidate running for one party and my political opponents were motive, like they had a vested interest in believing the worst of me because um, you know, the worse your opponents are, like if your opponents are crypto fascists and white supremacists, then it must mean that you're really good for opposing them. Um, you know, believing that your opponents are evil makes you feel really good about what you do. And it, moreover, it makes you think that anything you do to them is justified. Um, any amount of cruelty or malice that you show them must must be justified because they're evil people. And this kind of like purely kind of Manichaean worldview where the other side is like an embodiment of abstract evil and your side is good. This is a really, really dangerous worldview. Um, it leads to like overwhelming moral intoxication where you start to think that whatever you do is going to be justified because you're the good side. Like this is how you get mass atrocities. Um, so I, I don't mean to sound like hyperbolic when I say that, but it's a really dangerous way of looking at the world when you just start imagining that like there's, there's this dividing line between good and evil, you know, running through political classes or through races or through any other kind of category. That's not how it works. All of us have within us a capacity for both and an obligation to try to bring out the good and to try to restrain the bad in, in our own hearts. Well, and you, also, you also go on to say like how we cannot live in a world where people can't privately discuss ideas without fear that they're talking to an informant. And I think that's another really important statement to make. And it sort of sums yeah. up, I think, your whole case of, look, this conversation, and, and, and really, if you really break it all down, was none of my business. It was none of any of our business. And I'm sure everyone watching this has said something in private to their loved ones or to a friend that could be seen as racist if it was taken out of context. Um, you know, we, we need to be able to have tough dialogues with yeah. the people what we trust. What do you trust. say to your spouse about your mother-in-law? Like, <laughs> yeah, completely. I mean, if, if, if and, the, and the and the scary thing is, this was a person you saw as a friend, uh, a colleague, and to to come forward and expose you the way they did, and then claim anonymity, and then you know, it's just it it really is scary. And what is the goal? And and people need to also step back and realize this is politics. This was clearly a, a move to better you know a party side. I don't think that there's any proposition that is off should be off limits to philosophical inquiry or to empirical investigation, right? Like you should be able to try to figure out the truth of any kind of statement. Um, I do think that there are limits to when you should do that publicly, because there are some ideas that are kind of like very complex and morally fraught that you maybe don't want to just put out into the wild too casually. You should be able to at least privately or in like an academic context, you should be able to seek truth candidly and without fear. And what's one of the things that I think this form of cancel culture is doing is making people very afraid of open inquiry. It's having a kind of chilling effect, not just on free speech, but even on your ability to privately um, kind of, yeah, to, to try to understand an issue that's complicated. Yeah, pri privacy is it just it's an essential precondition for life in a free society. And um, there's something vaguely tyrannical about people who would try to dissolve that boundary between public and private spheres so that they can like root out thought crimes, essentially, um, or what they think are thought crimes uh, because they've misunderstood it. Um, and then but the bigger threat, I think, is just sort of is to interpersonal relationships, because 
friendship and trust are like trust is the great invisible good that binds societies together and when you start worrying that the person you're talking to is like recording you and is an informant and is going to go to the press um, and try to destroy your life um, that's just it's a, like it's a really really corrosive thing to do so I wanted to get that out because I, I think that's an important that's an important dimension like when you start marrying cancel culture with surveillance culture <laughs> that is that is not a world you want to live in um, and we need to push back against that. No, well said. And, I, and I, let's continue that. But I mean, it is connected in a way of even when someone, this radio personality tried to sort yeah. of have these conversations and point out, even allow you to say what you're saying right now, they were canceled in a way. They were, it, yeah, it, so, And so even to try so and defend it, it, yourself to prove these statements, now as a culture, we can't even do that. A lot of people jumped on this story because they, um, you know, in this case, it, it, and it goes both ways, obviously, but in this case, um, I was a conservative candidate and um, people, you know, particularly kind of highly educated liberals and progressives, tend to have an extremely distorted view of conservatives. They believe that everyone really is motivated by ignorance and malice and you know, racial animus or something. Yeah, I mean, and conservatives so can't be doing you know, all the immigration things you did, all that refugee stuff. Come on, conservatives don't do that. Right, right, exactly. Like that's the that's the stereotype, right? So, if you genuinely believe that people on the other side are are evil people, and then you see a headline that confirms your bias, it's really like you want to believe that. Um, you get a little hit of dopamine every time your your prejudices are confirmed. Um, there is absolutely you have absolutely no incentive to read that article critically, to think about whether there's another side of the story, to think about whether you might be wrong. It's much easier to just believe it. Um, but in that way, you end up kind of deepening your this is very distorted sense of reality. Um, so yeah, I guess you know part of it is just it's incumbent on on us as individuals to try to become aware of our of our of our prejudices and to actively try to challenge them. You know, try to actually inhabit the, the the point of view of people with whom you disagree with very strongly. And if you can't understand their point of view, like if you look at someone else arguing something and you think that they're just like stupid, then you are the one who is missing something. Um, you know, if you can't articulate your opponent's views in terms of that they would re recognize and understand and agree with, then you haven't understood them and then you haven't understood your, your own po point of view either. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, just take a page from J.S. Mill, like... Um, that if you know only your own side of an argument, you know little of that. Um, that should sort of be your your starting point, I think. Well, I, I want to say, just because I, I, it's it hurts me in my heart to know that you're in a place there where you still feel like you can't put yourself out there and get work. I mean, I have still am getting to know you, obviously, but I can just tell how intelligent you are, well-spoken you are, how kind you are, uh, and, it, and you should be out there and you should be able to speak more, even teach anything. Like, it's just what's so sad in this culture is I feel like, you, of all people, have probably learned more than so many more. You were already so intelligent, but going through this experience has made you so much even more profound, and you are a voice that should be heard and we should be listening to. Uh, and so I hope anybody who's gotten this far and, and listening to you in the interview, they will show you some support, they will give you some love and try and come and get you back out into the light uh, because I feel like you need to be back out there in the spotlight because I think you're just so well-spoken and you're clearly smarter than me, uh, politically at least. <laughs> I, 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 I can probably get you on movies. Uh, uh, but politics, you'll cream me. Uh, but I, I, I hate to see you that down that way. So uh, thank you for <laughs> having this exchange. Get me movies. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll bring you on a nerd war someday. We'll really see how you go. Uh, but I want. I, w what else do you want to sort of say now that you? I'm giving you obviously an opportunity. Hopefully, new people watching you. Is there anything you've sort of wanted to say to them or to people to sort of give you uh, a, a moment back? Like what, anything you want to offer? Um. Well, I guess you know. Here's one thing. And it's for anyone who finds themselves going through something like this or something not like any, I think, any form of loss. Um, the most challenging thing for me, like where my real dark night of the soul was, was in, um, in feeling like I had been rendered completely useless. Um, because, you know, one, I, I actually... I think I generally sort of adhere to the dictum that people who want political power should probably be kept very far from it. Um, but I, I was going into politics cause I like, I actually, I genuinely, and everyone says this, but like, 
I really liked the idea of being able to like serve the people that I was meeting. Um, I wanted, I looked forward to being like their friend and their neighbor and being able to help them and hopefully do something good in my province. And, um, I thought I had something to offer. Uh, and so I was, you know, so you, your opportunity to serve in that capacity is taken away, but then, and also in every other capacity, like I can no longer financially support my kids. Um, I felt, uh, like I can't really do a lot of the international human rights work that I used to do or that I want to do because I am now a liability to any cause that I attach my name to. Uh, that was like, that was, that was the really painful thing. And that's the point at which you sort of, you start, you sort of stare into oblivion and you, you start to really like the idea. Um, but I think the way that I reconciled myself to that, at least partly is by realizing, okay, all this stuff has been taken away from you, but you can still be, you can still be good to your friends. You can offer comfort to strangers. You can be a mother to your children. And that has to be enough. Um, so like, yeah, <laughs> sorry. In any small way that you can, that you can serve people, that you can make the world better, you do that. Um, and yeah. Sorry. No, I'd give you a hug if I could. I, I, I feel it. I've been there. I, I, I so relate to the struggle you're having. And, I, and that's, it just makes me angry because I don't, I don't know why we as a society can't see more of this and embrace it and sort of, and reach out to console. And it's so frustrating. And so I'm so glad I could at least we could speak and, and share yeah. this. I mean, I, I relate wholeheartedly. I mean, the takeaway I got, if I can offer any of my own advice, whether it takes or not, is I, the, the first job I got back was so hard <laughs> and it was not what I wanted to do, but it was just sort of getting out there outside of my own shell to realize I'm not worthless uh, because yeah. I think the world wants to tell us we're worthless and we're canceled and there's nothing we can do. Get out. Yeah. It's time for the next one. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, nobody's worthless. That's the, that's the reality. We're all, the other thing that I take away was just like, everybody is going through something, right? You never understand oh, yeah. it. Uh, and I think you and I probably got so lost in our own stories that we sort of sometimes forget, man, my life is crumbled and destroyed, but holy crap, look at this person who's working three jobs, trying to just make their ends meet and didn't even that's, have the, the, the means that we had. You, like you actually, when I think when you're going through something like this, if you look around, you realize that people all around you are going through like life shattering trials all the time and, and often bearing it with incredible like grace and, and, um, and courage and humor. Um, and so it makes you better able to like, you remember that I think that there's a, there's kind of a human need for suffering, like as much as we need love and beauty and friendship, I think we need to be challenged. Um, it's in, it's an inextricable and also a profoundly valuable part of being human. Um, and through that, I think like I heard something the other day, it was something like the dark night of the soul is it's an initiation, um, into some deeper phase of life. And, and through that, it makes you more human. And I think that's the, that's the level on which we can all, we can connect with each other. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I would, that's what I would say to anyone who's going through it is that, um, yeah, it, it's a, it's a chance to sort of become the kind of person that you hope that you would be. Well, we absolutely are human. I think that's the, the core message that we have to remember with each other. And I hope you, if I can help at all as a stranger who's now become a fan, just don't give up. Don't be afraid. There are people out there who have your back. Uh, we want to hear your voice. I want to hear your voice. Uh, and I, Hope you get to have more of a voice moving forward, and I hope this conversation can have some other people reach out to you to, to make sure of that. Is there one place they can go uh, see you, follow you, uh, email you? Is there anywhere we can send some love your way? Yeah, yeah. Go. Um, so I'm I'm in currently developing a podcast series. Um, uh, in, it's called The Worst Thing Ever, and it's where people talk about, as the name suggests, the worst thing that ever happened to them. Um, and it's about, you know, trying to sort of rescue a language of suffering from a culture that likes to try to erase it. Um, so so that's, uh, that's a project I'll be launching sometime in the next, uh, hopefully the next couple months. Um, but people, if you want to read more about this or connect with me, you can go to my website, which is kaylinford.com, and I'm sure you can provide a link. Uh, or follow me on Twitter, where I very rarely post things, but I'm there, so. 
absolutely. I will link all of that in the description, put it here on screen, uh, go to the website, the, her Twitter. Uh, and I'm so excited for that podcast. I am most happy to be there for you as a guest or any sort of producer I, I help so. you need. That's, you have I my word. To get your side of the story because you clearly like you've been through it. And I, I think you have a lot to share too. Yeah, no, absolutely. You, you, I ha you, I'm here for you. Tell me what you need. I will talk to you anytime. I'm so grateful. And I hope we can continue these conversations. I'd love to have you on. Sometimes uh, the world of movies and politics combines and it'd be nice to get your perspective <laughs> on things. So I'm grateful that's that good. we could meet. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andy. I want to thank Kaylin Ford for sharing her story. Please support her by visiting kaylinford.com. C-A-Y-L-A-N-F-O-R-D.com. You can hear more stories like these by supporting us on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you find your podcasts. Please go leave us a good review and rating to help others find us. And if you know of a story that is worth sharing on this series, please reach out to me, Andy Signor, on social media or visit Hugging the Cactus on Facebook. I'd also like to thank all of our Kickstarter donors. I couldn't have done this without you. If you'd like to support this series to keep it going, you can visit uncancelled.com. See you next episode.